tokenized assets have the potential to become an important new source of value for the financial industry and enabling interoperability between various blockchains is crucial to making this happen. And to that end, SWIFT, Chainlink and more than a dozen of the world's largest financial institutions recently announced the results of a series of experiments to enable secure interoperability between public and private blockchains. To find out more, we're joined by Jonathan Ehrenfeld, Head of Security Strategy at SWIFT and Sergey Nazarov, Co-Founder at Chainlink. Welcome to the both of you. Welcome back to Cybos TV. We've been here before. It's great to see you again in Toronto. And I hope you're enjoying your time here in Canada this year round. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you, uh, sir. Could you, uh, could you tell us what the main driver was for SWIFT to conduct these recent experiments? Sure. So uh, let me start with the first one. The first one is that we do believe that tokenized assets or digital assets are going to become mainstream very, very rapidly. So the, every prediction every assumption points out to these ramping up very quickly and coming to becoming part of trillions of assets that are going to be under management by regular institutional clients. Uh, that's number one. So there is a market potential. Number two, these institutional investors or asset managers that will hold these assets uh, will want to hold these assets everywhere in the world and they will count on their custody network to actually hold them for them like they do today for traditional assets. And uh, these custodians need to connect to all of these chains, all of these platforms in a secure, reliable, scalable way. And guess who has been providing that for many years? It's Swift. So for us, it was very important to show that we can also be that connectivity layer between banks, uh, custodians, asset managers, and these new platforms. So uh, that was the main driver to do these experiments. So, Sergey, let me ask you, what is the ability to, to securely and seamlessly connect all blockchains uh, unlock for, for capital mar markets? Sure. Uh, I think, to, to Jonathan's point, there's going to be a lot of adoption of tokenized assets, whether those are stablecoin assets, real world tokenized assets, or, or various other types of assets. And what that basically means is that the transactions that banks will be involved in will be on blockchains whether they generate those assets or whether they need to get them from others. So the importance of being able to go on blockchains and transact on blockchains is going to acquire the same importance as being on the internet. So there was a period where the internet didn't exist or wasn't widely used by banks. And then the internet appeared and the banks that got on the internet were able to transact with each other and grow and become successful. And then the banks that were laggards and got on later were not as successful. And the banks that didn't successfully get on the internet probably had huge consequences from that. So this is the same magnitude of, of an event as the internet, basically. Because now you'll have the actual transactional value that banks are seeking to exchange with each other, hold for their clients, basically the core of their business, which is all these different assets. But now they'll be on these different chains. And so they'll need to connect to the different chains efficiently through the use of SWIFT and other uh, key systems like CCIP to connect them to the last leg of the blockchain systems. And then they'll also need the different chains to connect to each other so that all of those assets can be moved across chains um, and therefore have larger markets. Jonathan, why is the ability to connect to either public or, or private blockchains so important uh, to be able to be done on their existing system, so important to banks? Right. I mean, banks have like a million things to do, right? And all of these things have cost. All of these things are taking part of their margins out, etc. So if, if you are able to prove that by using technology that has been there for a while, like Swift, with new partners like uh, um, Chainlink or anybody else, that it's, it's proving that they know how to lead the game. Uh, and you can prove to the banks that they don't have to invest massive amounts of uh, money, but they can use their systems, their legacy systems to connect in the seamless way using infrastructure that they have already invested. It's a huge advantage for them. So for them, it's, you know, it's a no brainer. Mm. Uh, Sergey, can you talk about some of the possible exciting different use cases that you could see uh, a major banks unlocking uh, for corporations and investors through tokenization, interoperability and, and on chain finance? Sure. I, I think initially it'll be a few different assets that aren't currently available or fractionalized that are the more attractive assets that'll have demand from clients. What I'm seeing are things like carbon credits because that's a new type of asset. I'm seeing tokenization and fractional shares and funds. And I'm seeing a, a decent amount of real estate tokenization and fractional ownership of that. But I think it'll go very far beyond that because 
the corporations um, actually want to tokenize um, all the assets they can. They want to tokenize cash flows. I think there was this period of securitization um, in the past that kind of got a little bit too exciting. There was almost too much securitization, and then that has died down. So what I really see tokenization and real-world asset tokens and all this stuff being is like securitization 2.0, but done the right way because now it's in this reliable, transparent system called the blockchain, and the ability to move all that value around with something like CCIP is what gives uh, the liquidity and the markets for all that, all that value. So I think we're basically going to enter a world where things are going to be called tokenized or real-world asset um, tokens, but it's really just securitization 2.0 done the right way. And as we know, those types of dynamics can grow to massive, massive sizes. Mm. Uh, Jonathan, private markets with previously illiquid assets have been some of the early markets to adopt tokenization. Uh, how do you anticipate the use of tokenization to expand across other asset types? Uh, and what role does interoperability uh, have to play in that? Yeah, pri private markets has been an interesting use case because, as you mentioned, they are illiquid, they are underserved. And anything that is illiquid and underserved where you don't have a big secondary market where it's hard to get into the issuance space where it's complicated and tokenization can simplify things. If you look at very simple uh, 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 assets like bonds, for example, or fixed income in general, um, many use cases have focused on that because it's very simple to test it technically. But in reality, the benefits that you will get by tokenizing a bond are very small compared to the benefits of tokenizing a private equity, right, or a pre-IPO share, anything that is illiquid and underserved. Mm. Why interoperability plays a, 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 um, a role is because in, with these type of assets, you will have so many actors that are part of the chain. You will have probably multiple chains. We will have multiple types of payments that are needed to actually fund for those assets. And you need to interconnect in this sort of spider web of different platforms that are acting as digital islands. And this is where Swift um, has been testing in, in different type of experiments, including the one that we did with Chainlink and these dozen banks on how you can actually manage that complexity and that fragmentation. Mm. Sergey, what, what are some of the key considerations that banks need to, uh, bank leaders and decision makers need to make when embarking on their digital asset journey? And uh, what role does interoperability play in their ability to succeed? I think they should think about where they want to be in the market. So do they just want to, do they want to completely avoid the whole blockchain digital assets trend? which I think everyone understands now is an inadvisable decision. Do they just want to provide custody of other people's assets? Do they want to make their own chain and have a stable coin of their own? Or do they want to have a chain, a stable coin, and generate hundreds of their own assets? I think all banks will end up in the final category. And to Jonathan's point, I think there will be multiple chains, hundreds of chains, uh, at least one chain for every bank, probably multiple chains for every bank. And then once there's multiple chains for every bank, um, you'll end up needing to connect all those chains because if you have your own chain and that chain isn't connected to the chain of your counterparty, then you're kind of on this siloed island. And, and that's the fundamental problem that we worked on solving and we're able to successfully solve together with SWIFT and, and uh, this work that we've done together and these banks and the other uh, CSDs that were involved is we were able to show that you can connect public chains and private chains in one big network, which we call an internet of contracts, using CCIP. So that once you get to the point where you have your own chain, you have your own stable coin, you have your own real world assets in the hundreds, you have access to all the counterparties and their chains so that they can transact with you. They can sell you their assets and you can buy um, assets from them and, and all of this kind of can, can really evolve into a large glowing market with a lot of liquidity, which is uh, you know, a fundamental piece of, of all of this working. So you've been working with leading banks for a number of years now, I think it's fair to say. How have you seen people's approach to blockchain changed uh, recently? And how do you see the on-chain finance space sort of evolving in the coming 12 to 14 months? And, and what role does interoperability have to play in that? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's changed pretty dramatically. So the first version of, of the capital markets view about blockchains was it's a toy, it's never going to go anywhere. Mm. The second version of the view was there'll be one big global chain, everybody will be one on one network, one chain for the whole world. Then there was a view that I'll make my own chain and everybody will come to my chain and I don't need to worry about anyone else's chain. That's the most recent iteration that we've now left behind. And now we've arrived to a world where everyone realizes they're going to have to have their own chain. 
just like they have their own database, they have their own website. And now we're kind of getting into the stage where people are realizing that, oh man, if I have my own chain, I actually need to make sure that that's connected to my counterparty. Because even if I successfully have my own chain, even if I successfully make a stable coin, even if I successfully make very high quality assets on my chain, there won't be a market to buy those assets or to use my stable coin or to interact with my chain unless I get it connected to other chains. So interoperability is a critical fundamental component to any bank's uh, ability to make blockchains work for them. And that's, uh, that's kind of where we are. And that's why CCIP is getting so much adoption and why I think there's a real need for a TCP IP like uh, solution to unify all the different blockchain technologies into this one internet of contracts that can connect all, all the different chains, both public chains and private chains into basically one big, highly efficient, highly globalized universal market uh, where all of these people can transact uh, kind of like they do over the internet with TCP IP but in this case over CCIP across all these different multitudes of chains. Mm. Uh, Jonathan, for the CTOs who are watching, uh, what considerations and interoperability plans uh, do, should banks be thinking about when adopting blockchain, blockchain technology? Yeah, I mean, in general terms, the message that I would say to any CTO watching is, you need to get urgently lunch with your chief risk officer, with your chief legal officer, with your chief operational officer, with compliance officer, because this is as much as a technical situation as it is a legal situation. And there's questions about liability, there's questions about compliance, there's questions about operational risk, recourse, etc., that are way more important than the technical consideration. Is Many of these questions that we actually try to answer during the experiment, a few remain open, but I think it's, it's, it, it goes beyond the technical questions. It goes into all of these questions that I was mentioning. So for me, that's the message for the CTOs. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, fascinating conversation as always, and it's a pleasure to have you back on Cybos TV. We're not going to keep you much longer. I'm sure you've got many, many interesting conversations and important conversations to have over the coming days at Cybos 2023 here in Toronto. So thank you for your time. That's Jonathan Ehrenfeld, Head of Security Strategy at Swift, and Sergey Nazarov, co-founder at Chainlink.